Hilchos Ma'acholos Asuros Perek Revi, the laws of forbidden foods, chapter four. We are going to discuss today two prohibitions: nevela and trefa. Nevela means car- carcass, dead animals, and trefa means literally attacked or pounced upon animals. But we're going to see that it means mortally wounded animals. Both of these carry a prohibition to be eaten, both from animals, beasts, or birds. And that's the topic that we're heading into to define exactly when it's prohibited, how much is prohibited, and what defines an animal as a nevela or a trefa. Says the Ramam Halacha Aleph Ha'echel Kezayis. If somebody eats an olive sized amount, mi besar behema shemesa, from the flesh of an animal which died, oichaya shemesa, oif shemes, or a beast that died, or a bird that died, like you get lashes. Shanamar, because it says, this is a clear verse, loisaychlu kol nevela. Do not eat any carcass. Says the Rambam, although I use the word die, also if you slaughter an animal, but you don't slaughter it properly, and there's a whole section of laws, as we're going to explain in a second, that deal with slaughtering. If you don't slaughter it properly, that's considered dead. And if you were to eat from that animal, it's like eating from an animal which is dead and it's totally forbidden. In the laws of slaughtering, which is coming up next, we're going to explain which slaughtering is considered proper, which slaughtering is considered improper. Now the Ramam tells us a very interesting rule. The only animal which can become forbidden on account of being a carcass, being a nevela, is only if the species is a kosher species. Because these are species that could be slaughtered properly. And if they will be slaughtered properly, they'll be kosher for eating. But if you're dealing with a non-kosher species to begin with, you're dealing with a horse, where slaughtering won't help. Even if you're going to keep all the slaughtering laws and you're going to slaughter a horse in the proper kosher way, the horse is going to be non-kosher. Non-kosher whether it was slaughtered properly, or a died of natural causes, whether you chopped off a living limb from a live horse, let's say, and you ate it, in the case of a non-kosher species, we don't hold you accountable for the prohibition of eating from a carcass or a mortally wounded animal. The only thing we're going to hold you accountable for is for eating non-kosher meat. This sounds very much like the principle we learned in the last set of laws, Ein isur halal isur. One prohibition cannot take effect when an earlier prohibition is already in effect. The horse, when it's born, is not kosher. So that is the prohibition that lies on its meat. Later on, when it dies, you can't have the new prohibition of the carcass take effect. The prohibition of non-kosher animals is already in effect. That's the simple understanding here of the Rambam. Others say no, the Rambam doesn't say it in his language. He means just a different principle. The fact that it's non-kosher, that's all that we care about. We don't care about any other imposed conditions. So it has to be an animal which is kosher and then die, and that's the animal that classifies as a nevela. That's as far as animals and beasts. What about birds? It says the Rambam Allah Gimel, Ha'oichel oif toher chai kol shehu. If you eat a complete live kosher bird, that's very small, you take a, uh, let's say a hummingbird, okay, I don't know if it's a hummingbird or it's kosher, but let's say you took a hummingbird, let's say it was kosher, very unlikely, right? But you swallow the whole thing whole. But you know what? Okay, let's use a kosher bird, okay? You have a chick, it just hatched yesterday, it's tiny. Boom, you take the whole thing, put it in your mouth. says the Rambam. You will get lashes for eating a carcass even though it doesn't have an olive-sized portion, the whole thing total is smaller than an ounce. You don't get lashes. Since, I'm sorry, you get lashes since you ate the whole thing. Which is like the category of burial we saw two days ago. When you eat an entire creature, you're held liable no matter how big or small it is. So here, fascinatingly, the live bird, even though it's a kosher bird, has become a carcass by you eating it completely. Why is it not aver min hachai? Why is it not a limb from a living animal? So the commentaries say when you eat a whole animal, it's not a limb. You're eating a whole animal. So we can only hold you accountable on account of a carcass. Huh? Yeah, that, that, that's the point. When you eat it live, you're considered as eating a dead animal. 
because you're killing it as you go down. If you ate this small bird after it had died, now, because it's already been considered an Avela, now you have to have an ounce. It has to be an olive-sized portion to keep you liable. Because there's no importance anymore to an entirety of a creature, only when it's alive. Once it's dead, it's like everything else needs to be an olive size. What counts to the, to the olive size? Even if the total flesh on the chick is not a kezayis, since the total body of the bird has an olive size, you're held liable for eating a carcass. If you eat an olive-sized portion from the flesh of a stillborn fetus of a kosher animal. So a cow gives birth to a stillborn and you eat from that stillborn. You also get lashes on account of eating from a dead animal because it's dead. In truth, it's forbidden to eat from any kosher animal even if it was born viable until the night of the eighth day of its life. Because the rule is, like, kind of like by humans, we say that, that a month creates viability. So for animals, it's eight days. If an animal didn't survive for eight days, it's considered still like a stillborn. We don't know if it's viable, and therefore you can't eat it. If it ain't like in a love, you're not going to get lashes for it, because we don't know for sure that it's a dead animal. But we're in doubt. You cannot eat it one, uh, unless eight days passes. If you're a farmer, you're a professional breeder, it's, it's certain to you that the animal completed its months, which means it went through a full gestation. It came to full term while it was still in the stomach of its mother, and only then was it born. Full gestation means nine months for a big size animal and five months for a small domesticated animal. Then the day it's born will be permitted because you know that it's come to full term. The placenta which emerges with a baby animal is forbidden to be eaten. But if you eat it, we're not going to hold you liable because it isn't meat. So we can't say you ate actual nevela. So that covers the laws of the nevela. Now we move to the next category, the trefa. If somebody eats an olive-sized portion of meat, from the flesh of an animal, beast, or bird, kosher ones that were attacked. Okay, we're going to translate nitrifu as attacked, although we're going to, in a second, define this in the halachic way. Like you get lashes. Shanemar, because it says, here's the verse. It's one of the verses where Hashem calls us holy. It says, You should be holy people for me. Uvasar basada treifa loisei Flesh that's been pounced upon in the field, you shall not eat it. La kelev tashlichun, I say throw it to the dog. This is actually a live picture, right? The lion is eating up a full little deer here, a coyote. I can't tell what it is. It's a spring bug. Huh? It's a, it's a deer? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a buck. A buck, a small one. This is a trefa right here. So you get lashes. Shalemar, uvasar, basada, trefa, loise, chelo, la kelev tashlichun, I say. Now, trefa ho amura batoira, the literal context of the word treifa, torn or attacked, that's stated in the Torah, Zusha Tarfa Oisa Chayasayar, is an animal that was torn or pounced upon by a beast of the forest, by a wild beast. Like a lion or a leopard, something like that. Or a bird that was pounced upon or attacked by a bird of prey. Like a hawk, a hawk digs into an animal, now it's a trefa. However, you cannot interpret the verse to mean that it's an animal that was attacked and killed. The moment it's dead, it's in the other category of nevela, dead animal. Because who cares how an animal died? Bottom line is it's dead. What's the difference to me if it died on its own? Or you hit it with a sword and you killed it. Or an animal, a, a lion broke it and, and killed it. So obviously we've established fact one. Trefa means it's been attacked and it hasn't died. So now we have to define it. Attacked and not died, to what extent is it, is it forbidden? If a torn animal that didn't die is forbidden, how torn does it have to be? 
one could think, if a wolf comes and drags away a goat by its foot or by its tail or by its ear, comes a man, the farmer, the shepherd, chases away the wolf, saves the the, the goat from the wolf's mouth. You could think that's also forbidden because it's been attacked, it's been torn. Right? Because we said that treifa is out, it's not dead, but it's pounced upon. So does pounced upon mean just attacked? And if you save it right away, it's still kosher? It's still, it's it's, uh, it's forbidden, sorry? It says the Ramam, no. It's still viable. Oh. That's the secret. Talmud Leymar says the, says the verse, the following words. Uvasar basada treifa begoymer la kelev tashlichun oise. The key words are the words in blue. The animal that's been torn in the field, you cannot eat, throw it to the dogs. By saying those words, Torah is communicating to us. Ad sheyasa oisa basar haruuya la kelev. When does an animal become forbidden on account of a treifa? When it becomes meat that can only be given to the dogs. This is here, here we emerge with the proper definition. From here we learn. That when the Torah uses the expression treifa, what does it mean? It means something very specific. First of all, it was pounced upon by an animal in the forest. It was broken to the point that it's leaning to death. And it hasn't died yet. Once it reaches that point of leaning towards death, even if you chaparain, like we say in Yiddish, you cash in on the opportunity and you slaughter the animal before it dies, it's already forbidden because it's been pounced upon. Since it cannot live from this wound. And we'll soon say you can't live for 12 months. That's the, that's the defining window. If it's gotten a moral injury that it's going to die from in 12 months, that's the treifa. Nimtsei salamit. So it turns out that you're learning as follows. Here's what we have so far. This is very uncharacteristic of the Rambam. He's going to great lengths to define what the word treifa means. What do we have so far? Torah forbids a dead animal. That's the nevela. It also forbids an animal leading, leaning to death because of its injuries. Even though it hasn't died yet. That's the treifa. Now says the Rambam, I can extrapolate a new rule. The same way when it comes to a dead animal. We don't differentiate how it died. Whether it died on its own. Whether it fell off a roof and died. Or someone strangled it till it died. Or an animal pounced upon it and it died. The same lack of differentiation is going to apply to an animal leaning to death, which means you won't have to have it started off by a lion. It doesn't actually have to be pounced upon. Whether if an animal pounced upon it and broke it. Maybe it fell off a roof and most of its ribs were broken. Or it fell over and its limbs got crushed. Maybe somebody shot at it with an arrow and punctured its heart or its lungs. Or a sickness descended upon it on its own of natural causes. And caused the physical puncture in the heart or the lungs. Or broke most of its limbs. In other words, we're looking now at the injury, not at the cause. Since at the end of the day, with such an injury, the animal is leaning to death. Now we're going to categorize it also as a trefa. Whether the cause was at the hands of a human or an animal of flesh and blood, whether it was by the hands of heaven. So basically, we've taken the word trefa and totally lifted it out of context. Because the word trefa means torn. And now we're saying, it doesn't have to be torn by an animal. As long as it got the injury that would cause it to be dead in 12 months, it's already a trefa. So tell me, says the Rambam, Torah student, you're looking in the verse, you see the word trefa. You're telling me now, it doesn't mean a trefa. It could have been any way to get the injury. Why does it say torn or pounced upon? We have a principle in Torah. Torah speaks of the commonplace. In other words, Torah has to describe this law somehow, yes? So it's not going to start saying, giving us a whole lecture. If an animal gets an injury, it's going to die in 12 months, then you can't eat it. 
Just says treifa. That's the common way. How did animals reach a situation where they would die in 12 months? Typically. They were attacked in the wild. Dibar HaKos of Bahaiva. Torah speaks of the common case. You know how I know, says the Rambam? Because if you're not going to say that, if you don't listen to me, and if you don't define trefa as any way of the injury, well then, every word has to be literal. Look, besides the word trefa, you have the word basada. Flesh that became torn in the field. Okay? So maybe only if a lion pounces on a cow in the field. It's going to be forbidden. But if it's in your backyard, you have a pet lion and a pet cow, and the lion pounces on the cow, Maybe it's not going to be forbidden. Only in the field. Of course not. Of course it's forbidden always. So if it's forbidden in any circumstance of, of torn, so we can now further add to that and say that like a novella, we don't care how it got there as long as it got there. If it's injured in a way that it's going to die within 12 months, that's already a treifa. You learn from here that Torah is only speaking about the common case. In the field, that's where it's common. Yes, it doesn't happen in backyards every day. But if it does, it's forbidden. So what do we have? The inyan hakosov, the point, the intent of the verse is the following. If an animal is leaning to death because of its wounds, and it cannot live from the wound, asura it's forbidden. From this, the sages said, their rule, their cardinal principle. This is the rule. Any animal which in this situation will not live for 12 months is a trefa, it's forbidden. In the laws of uh, slaughter, we're going to explain at length. Which sickness makes it into a trefa? Which sickness doesn't qualify as a trefa? But suffice it for you to know for now that if you eat from a trefa, it's forbidden. We're in the laws of forbidden foods, right? So we have the, the result. If the animal came to this situation, you can't eat it. Those exact situations, we'll tell you later. In the laws of slaughter, it's actually 70. The 70 cases that make an animal into a trefa. But uh, once it is a trefa, it is forbidden. So too, if somebody cuts off a live limb from, an, from a kosher animal, this flesh is trefa. trefa. If you eat from it an olive-sized portion, you get lashes like eating a trefa. This is an interesting principle which we actually had a couple of days ago. It's called Shnei Surin Boyin Ka'achas, when two prohibitions come at once. You cut off the leg of an animal, you've done two things. You've cut off an animal, a, a limb from a live animal. Second, you've made the animal trefa, because it won't live now for 12 months. So since both prohibitions descended upon the piece of meat at once, it simultaneously becomes a limb from a living animal and a trefa, so you get lashes on account of both. Because this flesh came from an animal which wasn't slaughtered, but it didn't die. So why do we care how it, how it got cut off? If an animal cut off its leg, or if you cut off its leg with a knife? Who cares if I cut off a lot of it or, or part of it? The verse says, again, we're turning to, to, to the red letters. Flesh torn in the field, you don't need it. Once the animal becomes like flesh in the field, you've cut it off, it's trefa animal. And now we come to an important distinction between an injured animal and a sick animal. Trefa is an injured animal. If an animal is sick because its strength has weakened, it's leaning to death, since it got no injury in any of its limbs, which would kill it, it's permitted. Torah only forbids a circumstance which is like a situation where it was torn by an animal. Where the animal typically makes a wound in the animal that it's pouncing upon. So to here, to be classified as a trefa, it has to have a wound. It can't just be generally sick. However, even though this endangered sick animal is permitted to be eaten, the sages, the great sages, wouldn't eat from such an animal, where people are just rushing to, to slaughter it just so it shouldn't die. Even though it, uh, it moved, Pirkus will soon define what that means, even though it made a slight movement at the end of the slaughtering, which indicates that it was alive and healthy, because only... 
such animals make those movements, doesn't matter. The davar zeh ein by Isra, but the Ramam repeats, it's not forbidden. You want to be strict in the matter? You're praiseworthy, no problem. But you don't have to be strict. Says the Rambam halacha yud gimel. Somebody slaughters an animal, a beast, or a bird, and no blood emerges. It's permitted. We don't say maybe the animals were already dead, and therefore there was no blood. It could happen. It's a phenomenon. I looked it up on Google. I couldn't find anything recent. But it seems like it, was, it, it happened. Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely, but it's permitted. If somebody slaughters a healthy animal and it doesn't convulse after the slaughtering, it's still permitted. But an animal that's endangered, which means it's an animal which you have to help it stand up. It won't stay standing. Even if it eats the food of healthy animals, if you slaughter it and it doesn't convulse at all, it's classified as a nevela, as a carcass, and you get lashes for eating it. But if it convulses, that shows that it was fully alive and it's permitted. The convulsing has to happen at the end of the slaughtering. In the beginning, it doesn't help. Now, what constitutes convulsing? What does convulsing look like? So if it's a small domesticated animal or any size beast, here's what convulsing looks like. It needs to stretch out its foreleg and bring it back. Or a hind leg stretching it out even if it doesn't bring it back. Or simply bending its hind leg. That qualifies as convulsing. That's already permitted. But if all it did was extend its foreleg, it didn't bring it back, that's, per, that's forbidden. That's not called convulsing. That's just called collapsing. That's the soul expiring. It collapses forward. If it goes forward and backward, that's a convulsion. That's all for smaller domesticated animals and all size beasts. Gasa for a larger domesticated animal, a big cow. So now, whether it's the foreleg or the hind leg, whether it extended without bending or bended without extending, that's all called convulsing, it's all permitted. Only if it was totally motionless, didn't extend the foreleg, didn't extend the hind leg, didn't bend any of the legs, then it's a carcass. Then it's dead. It's forbidden. Uba'aif, what qualifies as convulsing? For a bird, even if it only blinks an eye or swishes a tail, that's called convulsing. I mean, you see today in Kaparot, you go for a kipper, chickens do a lot more than that. They move their wings, the whole thing. But technically, even if it's a weak, weak, weak chicken, and all it does is blink an eye at the end of the shechita, that's a sign of at least a basic level of health, and it's permitted. Somebody slaughters an endangered animal at night time. He can't see. He doesn't know if it convulsed or not. It's a doubt. You got to rule stringently. You got to think it's a novella and you can't, you can't eat it. it. Says that I'm a general rule. We've been talking about in the last few chapters multiple types of forbidden foods. All forbidden substances in the Torah do not combine with each other to become one big forbidden unit. With the exception of the prohibitions of a Nazarite. A Nazarite cannot eat grapes, and he cannot eat grape peels or grape seeds, and all those things combine. If he eats them all together, they can combine to an olive-sized portion. But other prohibitions, not. Therefore, a person wants to make a little concoction. He takes a little bit forbidden fats, a little bit blood, a little bit non-kosher meat, umaat basar nevela, a little bit of carcass dead kosher animal, umaat basar dog tame, umaat basar oif tame, a little bit of non-kosher fish, a little non-kosher bird, the chayetze be'elu misharo yisur and anything like that, any other prohibited substance. Vitzeiraf min hakol kezayis, and the total sum total of it all is an olive-sized portion, but it's made up of all these different prohibitions. Va'achle and you ate it, ainay loike, you don't get lashes. V'dinay kedin eichel chatzishir. And the law is like the law of somebody who eats the half of a requisite amount. It's forbidden, 
biblically, but you don't get lashes. You only get lashes for eating all of size portion of one type of prohibition. Now, in one type of prohibition, you can have multiple units. All dead carcasses will combine with each other. A dead animal's meat will combine with a mortally wounded animal's meat. They're, they're both in the same category. A bunch of non-kosher animal meat will combine with each other. It's one prohibition. But dead kosher animal with dead non-kosher animal and mitarfin, they don't combine because they're two different prohibitions. So let's, let's visualize it. Keita, what does it look like? Here you have a cow, a deer, a chicken. That's all three categories. Behema, Chaya, Oif. They all die. Now they're all called Nevela. You take a piece of the Nevela of the cow, the Nevela of the deer, the Nevela of the chicken, and you combine it all into one olive-sized portion of meat and you eat it, like you get lashes. Why? Because they're all one category of prohibition. They're all nevela. Let's say the cow was dead and the deer was attacked. It's not going to live 12 months. You take a half an olive-sized portion of dead cow meat, half olive-sized portion of the pounced upon deer meat, or the deer was totally alive. You take a half an olive size of a dead cow and a half an olive size from the live deer, which is also trefa. The achle and you ate the total olive size portion. Look, you get lashes because they're all in the same category. The chain besar ha gomel ha chazir neves. You take a, a camel, a rabbit, and a pig. These are the three animals that are mentioned in the context of split hooves and chew their cut. They're each one in the Torah mentioned separately, but they're all one prohibition, non-kosher meat. So if you take a combination of camel meat, pig meat, and rabbit meat, you gather an olive-sized portion of meat together and you ate it, like you get lashes. But once you cross the line on two different prohibitions, aval im tzedaf chatzizayis menuv lasasher, you take from both of these screens, you take a half of an olive portion from the cow, which is nevela, because it's a kosher animal which died, and you combine that with a half a kazayas of a camel, non-kosher, now you cross the line. There's non-kosher meat and kosher meat that's dead. Two different categories. They don't combine. Same with all similar situations. Huh? Well, it, no, if you ate only half an olive of each one, you get no lashes. Oh, because I was original, yeah, yeah. Category. Each category, then you get separate lashes, yes. You get separate lashes for each. For each category. Okay, so, so there's more, so in other words... There could be more if you ate an olive size of each one. Right. But if you didn't, they won't combine because they're not the same category. Same thing if you have non-kosher animal, non-kosher bird, non-kosher fish, they don't combine. The flesh of them both don't combine. They're two separate prohibitions. Each one was prohibited by a separate negative commandment, as we explained. But within birds, you eat a half an olive portion of an osprey, half an olive portion of a starling, they're both non-kosher birds. They're one, they're one prohibition. They combine like all non-kosher animal meat combines. Zaha Klaw, this is the rule. Kol she isuran balav echat. You're holding a mixture of forbidden foods. If all the prohibitions stem from one prohibition, mitzarfin they combine to create the olive size. Bishnei lavin ein mitzarfin. If you're looking at your mixture, you see two separate prohibitions. They don't combine. Chutz min nevelo treifa, except for the nevelo and the treifa, the carcass, dead kosher animal, and the pounced upon kosher animal. Hoyel vaha treifa tchilas nevelo hi, because the being pounced upon or being mortally wounded is the beginning of becoming dead. Those two are combining. Now, let's define for a second what's considered carcass, what's part of the dead animal. You eat from a dead kosher animal, a mortally wounded kosher animal, a dead non-kosher animal, but you're not eating from the flesh directly. You eat from the skin, the hide, or the bones, or from the sinews, or the horns or the hoofs, or the hoofs, or the claws of a bird, from the point where if you had cut it off, blood would emerge. And from the placenta. 
Afal pishahu asur, even though it's forbidden because it's part of the dead non-kosher animal, harayza potter, you'd be exempt. Because they're not really fit for consumption. Torah says the flesh is forbidden, not everything else. They ain't mitzdarf in the mabas and the kazarias, and they don't even combine with flesh. You have a half an olive portion of meat from the non kosher animal, and half of a hoof. They don't combine. Kevas ha nevela, the kevas ha tmeya. When you find uh, milk inside the stomach of a dead or non kosher animal, dead kosher animal or dead non kosher animal, muteras it's permitted. According to the Rambam, it's considered like waste in the body. Therefore, you're allowed to use as an enzyme to start, to curdle cheese. You can use milk that was found in an animal that was slaughtered by a non-Jew. Fascinating. Non-Jew slaughters it. The animal's not kosher. You find milk with some rennet inside its stomach that it had just consumed before it died. You can use that to curdle kosher cheese. Why? Because it's considered waste. And you can also use the enzyme in milk found in an unkosher beast or bird. But the actual stomach lining, no. It's like a regular kishka of, uh, of an unkosher animal. It's forbidden. But if it's milk in the lining, it's okay. Can I get pun of shalchamayr? The skin which comes opposite the face of a donkey. The accepted explanation of this is the placenta. A donkey is born with a placenta. Mutter ba'achila, it's like, it's permitted to be eaten. It's like waste and urine, which is, for, which is permitted. It's not part of the donkey. There are some hides that are considered like flesh. If you eat an olive size of the hide, it's like eating flesh. We just said before that hide is not considered like flesh. There are some times when it is. If you eat it when it's soft, from specific animals. The Elo Sha'irasean keeps out on the following live creatures, their skin is considered like their flesh. Oirha Adam, skin of a human. Flesh of a human is forbidden by a positive commandment, the skin is the same way. The Oirha Khazir Shal Yishuv, the skin of a, the common pig. The Oirha Toitera Shal Gamal, the skin of a hump, of a camel. Shalaitanu Allah Masa Mi Ailam Balahigi Allah Masa, which was never loaded up onto it, and it didn't even reach the appropriate age of being loaded up. Shadayin hiraka, in which case it's, it's still soft, and it's like the flesh. Ve'er beis haboishes, the skin around the testicles of an animal. Ve'er shatachas ha'alya, the skin under the tail. Ve'er ha'shlil, and the skin of an animal discovered alive in the stomach of its mother after it's been slaughtered. Ve'er ha'anaka ve'hakoyach ve'halata ve'hachoymet. The skin of four out of the eight shratzim. We had these yesterday. Anaka is the porcupine, the hedgehog. Koyach is the chameleon. Lita is the lizard. And Chemet is the snail. These four, their shells or their, their skin is like their flesh when they're, skin, when they're soft, soft. Kol elu ha'eris kashayin rakis. All of these hides, when they're soft, harayin kibasar lechaldabar, they're like flesh for every matter. Bein li sarachila, bein latuma, whether for prohibition of consumption or for ritual impurity. Now the Ramam concludes with a, with a small issue. Nemar b'shir ha'nisko. There is a category in the Torah called the, the stoned ox. He's not drunk. Stoned ox means the ox that kills a human being. It says here, If an uh, ox gores, a man or a woman, and he dies, The ox must be stoned to death, and its meat cannot be eaten. So the Rambam says, we've got to analyze this verse. It says by the ox that's stoned to death, Its flesh will not be eaten. Now, in light of our whole chapter, that's pretty obvious. How would it be possible to eat it after it was stoned? It's dead. It's dead kosher animal. It's a nevela. It's forbidden already. Says the Rambam, the Torah must be telling us something new, a novel law. The moment the, stone, the, the ox was brought to court and convicted, it becomes forbidden. And at that point, even in its lifetime, it becomes like a non-kosher animal. Even if you come ahead and you slaughter at a kosher slaughtering, it's forbidden to have pleasure from it. You eat a olive-sized portion of the meat, you get lashes. And even when it is stoned to death, ultimately, 
You cannot have any pleasure from the meat. You can't sell it, can't give it, as a, give it to the dogs, can't give it as a gift to a Gentile. Therefore it says, Its flesh shall not be eaten. You know, in the Torah, you have sometimes the expression of You should not eat. Then you have It cannot be eaten. That means in any way, shape, or form, no benefit can be derived. But the waste of a stoned ox is permitted. You can use it for fertilizer, for example, because it's not part of the animal itself. If it turns out after it's convicted that it's actually exempt from being stoned, for example, the witnesses that were testifying against it became zaymimin. Zaymimin means their testimony wasn't attacked, they were attacked. Two witnesses came and said, you couldn't have seen what you said you saw because you were on a cruise with us on that same day. So now the animal is no longer being stoned. It's totally permitted. can go and graze in the field like a regular animal. Same thing after it was stoned. It was already killed. But then you find out retroactively that the witnesses were bad witnesses. Its status changes, it's converted, it's per- permitted to have benefit from. But at any rate, there's a special rule that for the stoned ox, while it's alive, once it's convicted, then it's forbidden.